So, Titanic, who has seen the movie? Come on. <laughs> who has liked the movie? Come on. In their youth, I mean. Anyway, um, we know Titanic's about, it's a love story, right? There's a ship, the ship sinks, a lot of people die. Um, <laughs> yep, it's really good, it's really good. So I happen to have here um, a folder um, with some files here. And um, there's like surprise sh, that's the script I used to do um, like image to ASCII. Uh, but there is a file which is called train CSV. And this file contains some actual historical data of the passengers of the Titanic. So you can see there's a passenger ID, there's survived, which means they survived or not. Um, the passenger class, the name, the sex, the age, the number of siblings or spouses, the number of parent or children, um, which ticket they had, uh, how much they paid for the ticket, which was their cabin, where they embarked. So uh, what I'm planning to do today is to basically um, investigate if the movie had any sort of like historical truth to it or not. And that's my only goal, actually, when I started the project, so yeah, whatever. Um, so we're going to use some really cool Python libraries to do that. And uh, I'm, I'm not really a Python guy, I'm not a data science guy, so like, the general, like, I think, thing is, if I can do it, anybody can do it. I just can copy some code off the internet, get it to run, understand like, the basics of it, try to change it a little bit, and then, I mean, like, if I can do it, like, anybody can do it. So um, I'm just going to write, um, I'm going to write a lot of code in this presentation. Hopefully, I'm not going to mess it up like too badly. Probably I will. So let's start. Visualize.pi. So we're going to import this library, which is called Pandas. It's an amazing library, and you should like, take a look at it. Um, and using Pandas, there is a way of like, loading a CSV directly. And they call it a data frame. So I'm going to call it a DF. And if I do pd read CSV, and I'm going to pass train.csv, I'm going to have this object which I can print the shape, and I can print some count, right? And if I save this, I run it in Python, it'll say, OK, we have 891 rows, 12 columns. And then the count, we can see that for every one of those columns, we can see which rows had that information. So we can see that in this case, for example, uh, we didn't have H for some of those, we didn't have the cabin for some of those, we missed some in Bart. But like in general, like the data looks pretty good. So what are we going to do first is to take a look at the data, because um, it's pretty useless to try to run some machine learning algorithm on some data. You have literally no idea what it is about. So, uh, and it's also pretty fun because you get to create some cool graphs. So there's that to it. Um, okay, so let's try to do something with it. So I'm going to import um, a library which is called matplotlib and has a little function called pyplot as plt. I'm going to create a figure with plt.figure fig. Uh, you have to pass the fig sides. I'm just going to pass something like this. Um, and now I'm going to delete this, and I'm going to show something at the end of it. And now I'm going to do df survived value counts. And now uh, matplotlib adds this amazing plot. And you just do kind uh, bar. And I'm going to pass an alpha just because otherwise it's a bit too painful on the eye. So if I run this, uh, something appears on the back. And you can see uh, this is actually um, the survived column on those 900 rows. Uh, zero means uh, unfortunately deceased, and one means survived. And we can see it's like more or less 350 survived, 550 died, right? Um, but our human brains aren't really so good at reading raw numbers, so I want to use some like percentages. And luckily, it's quite easy. You just do normalize true, save, run again. And now you'll see, actually, this is like something I can reason about. 40% of the people survived, and 60% of the people died. Um, it would be interesting to take a look, since we have the information of like all the age of the passengers, to take a look at what relationship there is between the age and um, the survival rate, basically, right? 
So um, the library provides uh, a really nice function, which is called uh, scatter. And if I just do scatter, I can pass def survived def h. And in this case, I'm going to pass a lower value of alpha because a lot of dots are going like, to end up on each other. Uh, let me also add some title to these things. So survived, and this will be um, survived, no, actually be like h with regards to survived. And in this case, actually, if we ran this code right now, it would like, display all the um, like graphs like, on top of each other, and we don't want that. So instead, we're going to use this function, which is called subplot to grid. And you can just pass like these general dimensions of your rectangle, and then like this is the spot this graph will take. So I'm just gonna put like this first and this second. And if I run this, you'll see you have this really nice looking graph. Um, if we take a look at this, it's pretty interesting because we can see that zero still means deceased, and one means that uh, uh, survived. Sorry, and we can see that. It's, it is true that like some of the older people died, and instead some of the younger people survived more. But actually, like the bulk of all the dots are pretty much in the same range. They're between the 20s and the 40s, and there's no like huge, you know, like change in the data. At least like it doesn't show, right? Um, so I thought just like it's really really interesting. As soon as you get this like raw CSV of stuff, like you can't really figure out, just like to try to cut it through like some sort of dimensions and take a look around. And you know, like maybe there's something in it. Um, okay, cool. So um, something else I'm gonna do is just like take a look at the passengers class distribution. So I'm just gonna do some like quick copy paste. Instead of survived, I'm going to do oops p class, and here this will be class Python. Almost. And we can see that 55% uh, of the people were in the third class, so like that was like the poorest class, and 25% of the people were in first class, and the rest were in second class. So there's like a pretty uneven distribution of the uh, passengers in those classes. Now, um, there's something pretty cool that you can use when you want to correlate two different dimensions. So basically, one of these is the scatter plot. Another one is called a kernel density estimation. I won't bore you with, with what it means, but it really looks cool, so I'm gonna build one for you. And basically, I want to correlate the class with the age of the passengers, right? Um, so I'm gonna, and also like this has like uh, a nice you know, um, little thing. So I'm sure I'm going to trigger some uh, PTSD around the room because I'm going to write something which looks like this. Call span. Yes. No. No web developers using tables. <laughs> no one wants to admit it, right? Um, so, call span two. So, this graph will take two columns. I'm just going to do for one in, uh, oops, uh, one, two, three, and then do um, DFH. And in this way, I'm filtering, like, uh, like what I want to extract is the age of my passenger, but between the square brackets, I can filter stuff. So in this case, I'm gonna filter their passenger class, just do something like this. And then I'm just gonna do plot kind equals KDE, which stands for kernel density estimation. And now I can just give it the title, so this would be um, basically their uh, class for T uh, H. And just for your, uh, safety, I'm going to add, add a legend to it. So it's just uh, first class, second class, third class. Okay. And this looks pretty cool. Um, what does it mean? If you take a look at the average of the ages, um, the third class passengers are younger. And instead, the first class passengers are older. It's sort of like there was some sort of relationship with how much money people had with the type of tickets they were like they could buy, and um, I think it's just like some like good ways of trying to make sense of information, just like try to visualize it a little bit. And as you can see, it's really simple to like do these graphs uh, using Matplotlib. Like, I don't know what like. Like, I, I don't know, if I had to do this using like D3.js, I'd probably just like gave up the project. Um, so, uh, no offense. Um, so I'm just gonna do, add one last image to this, which is just to show um, 
where the passenger uh, embarked on the Titanic. So here I'm just going to do here and here embarked. And this is like very useless information, but I think it's funny because um, I never knew this myself. Um, and actually, I thought that everyone just like got on in England, but actually only 70% of them got on in Southampton. And then the Titanic stopped once in France in Cherbourg, and then it stopped again in Ireland, in Queenstown. So like, this like, set of information shows also like, where these passengers are coming from. And probably the data could also tell us there is some sort of relationship between like, where they got on the Titanic and if they died or not, which is creepy. Um, but if you take a look at this, I think this is really cool. I'm just going to um, screenshot it. I think it's, yes. Um, and if you take a look at these graphs, there's something missing, which is the gender. Right? There's like no like cut out on the gender of the people who mm, were on the Titanic. And the reason why I did that is because the gender is really interesting. So I'm just going to do some simple copy paste. I'm going to copy this. I'm going to create a new file, which is called visualize um, gender. Pi. New. Almost. Yeah. And here, uh, I'm going just to keep the same structure. I'm going to add a couple more graphs. So I'm going to make like, the rectangle bigger. And here, I have something like this. And actually, in this case, I want to drill down a little bit. So I want to check if the sex of um, these passengers were male. And just do this. And here, I'll just do men survived. And copy this again. And just change this to uh, female. And this would be woman survived. So here, one, two. Just a small little detail. I'm going to change the color of the grass for the girls. So it's going to be um, FA0000. Uh, no, there's, no, that's cool. And here I'm going to do color equal female color. OK? And I have to show the graph again. So PLT show. And if I do this, they look quite good. Um, I mean, unless you realize that actually in the case of the women's graph, uh, the columns are, are inverted. So actually, of all the men, 20% uh, survived. And of all women, 70% survived. So when they say, like, women and children first, it was actually quite true. Um, and if we wanted to see just, like, the disparity uh, of the like, uh, like the sex comparison, like in all the survived people, we could do that quite easily, just like in the exact same way. So we just like copy this little thing, and um, we are just gonna set it like on the last cell. We're going to um, we want to show the sex now, but now we want um, this filter to act on the survived column. We're gonna do one, and here we're gonna do um, sex of survived. And I'm going to add like two colors in this graph so we can like differ differentiate between them. So this should work. And you see like this is the difference, right? Like of all the people who survived the Titanic, at least like on this data set that we have, I think this data set has only a thousand like passengers. And in total, like in the Titanic, there was like 3,000. But I think it's like a pretty good way just like, you know, like looking at things like in a sort of like almost objective way. And you see that like, of all the people who survived, 75% of them were uh, women. Now I'm going to do something really similar to what we did before, which is uh, kernel density estimation. I'm going to try to uh, use the class of the passenger to show their survival rate. Um, OK, let me close this. Let me know if I'm going too fast or if there's like something which is boring. Uh, so what do we do before? So like the same thing, using call span again. Uh, so this is like on the second row, starts from the zero, call span equal four. And here we can just like do some good old copy pasta from here. Yay. And paste here. Cool. And what we sh want to show here is not the age anymore, is the survived, right? And here would be, um, would be uh, survive, no, would be actually class uh, with regards to survived. OK? So, da, da, da. and there we have it. Um, so 
this quite like I mean it's quite scary in a sort of way because you see that the third like class passengers had like such a higher mortality compared to the rest. And instead, you know, like you see like the first class passenger, so they, I mean it's not like the best holiday they had, but you know, it's pretty good. Um, so this made me think, well, what about if you try to combine this information about um, the sex and the passenger class like together and try to show that like on all the different spots. If you remember the movie, there's this guy who is like uh, very poor and he's a man and this girl is like, very young and very rich, right? So we're just gonna see if, you know, like the movie holds on on this like core criteria. Um, so what are we going to do is to um, just like copy some code. I'm just going to do a lot of like copying of code, basically like my daily job. So um, <laughs> there's like some colleagues as well. So oops. Um, so zero. And here I'm going to add two filters together. So I'm going to select people which are uh, male and uh, DFP class equals equals one. So we're selecting the rich man rich man. Hope it's not like not the rock chain anyway. Um, P3 and this would be poor man and I'm going to put it like one close to each other, right? Um, yep, there it goes. So we can see that actually like in the poor, like in the rich man, like they're not doing great but they have like 35% survival rate and instead the poor man are doing horribly. They have basically a little like over like 10% survival rate. Um, so what if we try to like replicate this experiment uh, with the women? So we'll refer to some good old copy paste again. Here, copy paste here. I mean like you either have some like code prepared or you have to copy paste so I mean no shame here. Female female and here will be um, rich woman and here would be uh, poor woman, okay? And also here I'm going to, uh, let me just convert this, okay, color equal female underscore color and I'm going to do the same thing here, okay? And I think upgraded the columns as well, so I'm just gonna run this. Cool. So, um, yeah, this is pretty brutal, right? Like you, you can see, like basically, the rich man had a survival rate of 100 percent. Like if you print out the actual data, uh, there's like 100 rich women, and only three of them died. If you take a look at the poor women, like they're not doing like they're like doing okay, but they're still like 50/50. And if you take a look at these graphs, it's like pretty clear why you know this is Jack, and this is Rose. So, <laughs> right? Like, you know. Um, okay, so I spent a lot of time dr just, you know, like showing data and doing stuff like that. So I hope, um, I mean, um, it's like time well spent. I'm going now to, do s to use some algorithms to try to, you know, like predict this data. So the first algorithm I'm going to use is very simple. Well, like, you know, like the simplest algorithm would just be random and you have like more or less 50% chance of like getting the right answer because it's either survived or deceased. But taking a look at this data, one could think of a very simple, you know, heuristics, right? It would be if you're a woman, you survive, if you're a man, you die. I'm sorry for the audience because, you know, this case would be pretty brutal. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so I'm just gonna um, exit from here and create uh, a new file, which I call predict uh, gender pi. And here I'm going to import pandas again as pd. Here I'm going to give like a name as train because like in machine learning there's a lot about the training set and test set. So I, th I think it's good just like to call it train instead of df, uh, which is a panda specific term. So I'm just gonna do read csv train.csv and inside here, like as, as you've seen before, like we have everything. We have like all the columns. You can filter through them. And what is cool is that you can actually add more stuff. So you can do. Uh, I can add a new column which I call hypothesis. And in this, I'm just gonna fill every row to zero. And then I'm going to use a, uh, um, a method which is called lock, which you pass a condition and the column to update. So the condition would be if the sex 
of um, is female. And the column I want to update is the hypothesis. I'm going to set one. So this is like pretty simple. It means if the passenger I'm like taking a look at is a female, I'm just gonna like uh, like my hypothesis just just gonna survive, right? And now we just need like a simple way to check if our hypothesis is, co is correct. So oops, can't type. And just do lock again. And here would be if the survived um, column is the same as our hypothesis. Uh, okay. I'm going to update the result column with one, okay? And now I can do print a train um, result dot value counts, right? So I, I think this like makes sense in a sort of way. You think, okay, like here's my hypothesis. If she's a girl, she's gonna survive. And then I'm going to compare my hypothesis with the actual recorded value, which is the answer, which is survived. So if I do this, um, did I save? I hope so. No, the F is not defined. Oh, well, uh, I just said I'm going to call it train. So I'm going to replace the F with train. And I'm done. And now it says 701 is like, like we know like one is good, right? Like one means that our hypothesis is like the same answer as the survived column. But as I said, as humans, we can't really read these numbers. So I'm gonna play the same old trick, which is normalize true. And you see, wow, 78%. It's like such a simple heuristic, but it gives us like a 28% increase on just a random algorithm. So I think this is like a really good like, reason why you should always take a look at the data first before running any algorithm on it. Because sometimes just like a very simple, you know, like hint could give you some like really good answers. And it's, and you will see oops, in the future that uh, the more complex algorithms we run, uh, they won't give us like such a massive increase anymore. Because like there isn't like that much more truth in the data anymore. Um, okay, but I think this is pretty cool. So um, I said I was going to write a lot of code, but actually I lied because there is some code I didn't want to write just in front of you because it's like boring as hell. Um, but I'm gonna explain like what it does. So there's a function which is called clean data. We pass some data. It uh, fills all the rows which don't have the fair information and will like fill them in with the average value. They do the same with the age. They're going to transform the sex from a string to a number. And this is because a lot of these uh, machine learning algorithms are nothing but um, basically number crunching algorithms. So they don't really do well with the categories that like, our human brain deals with, but they're really good with trying to optimize numbers. And that's why you usually always want to do this sort of normalization and transform these things that we know mean something into just like pure numbers, in this case, integers. And so I'm going to do the same with like male. So like zero will mean uh, male and one will mean female. And I'm going to transform also the embarked information as well. Okay. So I think now uh, I've learned something from Nusco before. So I'm gonna cheat as well. There's like this, I, I love the web. So there's, let's try, yeah, look at that. How beautiful it is. So, um, yeah, so this is just, you know, like some graph. We have some leaves here, we're just like data points. And if I were to ask you, what is the general trend of this data? You'd say, well, you know, it's like something like this, right? You're like, yeah, like more or less like everything is there. And like the simplest machine learning algorithm just does this. It's like, it's no magic. It just like takes a look at the data points, tries to run some sort of like um, number crunching algorithm on it to try to understand what is a good line that fits the data. And it tries to minimize the error between what he thinks the value should be and the actual value. So like the first time you see a machine learning algorithm run, you're like, yeah, whatever, like this is dumb. I could do it, right? Um, the problem is like we're really good as humans to do this on two dimensions. But if I were to ask you to do the same operation in 15 dimensions, yeah, right? Like I, I can ask you, you know, uh, uh, time zones. Who understands time zones? Raise their hand. Really? Phone numbers? Who understands like phone numbers? You know, standards. 
it's really, really hard. Like if you try like to read the source code of a library who like trust to do that for a job, you're like, whoa, this is so hard. Like I can't keep all these like things in my head. I think the same happens for like different dimensions. They're just like too much stuff. Like our brain is just, oh, it's just like struggling a lot. And this is the reason why like a good numeric approach beats the human brain because like we're not really good at like dealing with 20 dimensions. If you think about uh, like image recognition tasks, they usually assign a different dimension to each pixel. So you have an image which is 50 by 50 pixel. So you're trying to solve a problem which has 2,500 dimensions. Like who can do that? I don't know, I can't. I can't like, I have like some issues like with this to be honest. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to create a file which is called uh, predict uh, logistic regression pi. And I'm going to import, uh, actually maybe I can just like copy some stuff. I mean, we're copying anyway. So, um, what do you just call predict gender? I'm just going to, well, actually there's nothing good copy. That's dumb. Um, but I'm going to use uh, my utils, which I just, um, explained before. And then I'm going to use this extremely good Python library which is called scikit-learn. So scikit-learn implements a bunch of machine learning algorithms just basically you don't have to do anything. And um, what I've shown here, this is usually called like in machine learning terms as a linear model and it's pretty clear to see why. It's just like trying to get like a very simple explanation of the data. And from scikit, this is like no surprise in there, you just import linear model. Um, cool, so here I've like imported our CSV. I'm going to use the utils to clean the data. So I'm just gonna do uh, train, right? And here I'm going to have to do a couple of things. So I'm, I have to pass this algorithm, what is the desired output, which is usually called target. And it's quite easy to do this, you just do survived and do values. And then we have to pass a set of information which are called features, which are basically what we tell the machine algorithms that like, these are the hints. You have to figure out stuff. Like, we're like really kind of like, you know, like the cousin which is sort of like berates people. Like, oh yeah, just like get this and do it. I, I don't really care like how you do it. Um, so the way we're gonna do that, we're just gonna pass like some information like the passenger class, class uh, like this, the age, the sex, um, I mean, we can pass, you know, like the number of sibling and spouses, the parent and children. I think that's enough. And just pass these values. Uh, ooh, values, cool. And now we're going to create this um, object which is called a classifier. And it's called a classifier because it just needs to take one of these passengers and decide like which one of these buckets like he needs to assign it to. So I'm just gonna call it the classifier and you just take linear model, uh, logistic regression. Yes, cool. And we just do classifier fit. We pass the features, we pass the target. And uh, actually maybe we want to assign this to like another variable. So I'm just gonna do something like this. And now we can print like the results of this classifier. So basically when, as soon as it said fit, um, the classifier tries to go to, through every row of the data and tries to find like some hidden relationships in the data. And then just as a way of like basically double checking if the, the thing is like doing anything at all, we can use like this score and we pass the features and the target again and this thing will print out like the um, accuracy. No, um, from, no, from import, right? I don't know Python. Uh, I said it. Cool. And you see, it says like 0.79%. So like it's 79%, um, which is better than our like naive interpretation. And I'm sure that like if we add like some more information, let's say um, the fare and like where they embarked, probably the algorithm will do better. See? Basically, we're just like telling him, okay, like you have like all these things to work with. Just like find me a good explanation of this. And uh, I go back to some drawings because like when you see something like this, I think it's pretty clear for us, okay, like this is the trend, right? But if we try to fit the same line like through here, like our human brain is like, oh, 
wait a second, like this doesn't look right. You know, like the data is like showing like a different behavior. And like this is usually known as a quadratic behavior. So like we as humans, we would say, oh, it's basically something like this, right? It's a curve. And uh, I don't want to trigger PTSD again, but like in math it's called like a polynomial. So usually it's like a first degree polynomial, it's a straight line. It's, if it's a second degree polynomial, it's like more of a curve. And then you go crazier and crazier. Um, so, no PTSD, please. Uh, but, like, <laughs> there is something in, um, in uh, scikit-learn which help you to do this, and it's called pre-processing. And what we can do is to take our linear features and tr transform and, and combine them into second-degree polynomials. So, basically, it's a way to say, okay, maybe our data could be described better with these curves instead of straight lines. So I'm just going to need to instantiate this. I think it's something called polynomial features. They're pretty good with names. Um, degree two. And here I'm going to create some polynomial features. And I'm going to do poly.fit transform and pass the original features that we had. Okay. And here basically we can just like do the same thing again. Um, we're going to do, um, actually we don't need to change the classifier because we didn't override it, right? So I'm just going to separate it a little bit. And I'm going to print this thing out on the polynomial features. Poly features and the same thing here. And you see, like using the polynomial features, that was like a pretty big win. Um, so we started, but like as I said before, like it's not like really that much of a win, like considering like what like like our simple like human intention, like uh, uh, intuition got us to, right? So I thought like this is like yeah okay, I mean computers are work pretty well, but like we humans like don't suck that much. Um, unfortunately, um, there is like something which I haven't said. Because like when you see like code like this, you're like, wow, this is like really, really easy, right? So like what's the trick? Like why is like like your neighbor, like not doing machine learning for fun. And the reason is um, a lot of these algorithms are a lot like black boxes. So you don't really get to understand too much what's happening in them. So I'm going to show an example and then I'm going to show some tools that we can use to try to prevent these biases of the machine. <laughs> Every time I, see, I say biases of the machine, it seems like some like dark, you know, like sci fi future. Um, so let me just do something which is extract this into um, feature names. I'm going to call this feature names and then paste this. Okay, cool. Um, and now I'm going to copy this into a new thing which we'll call predict decision tree. Paste. Uh, here we won't need the preprocessing, we'll just need the module is called tree. And um, basically what this algorithm does is to create a very simple decision tree. So we will take a look at the data at every row, we'll take a look at like all the characteristics of it, and we'll try to build some sort of like decision tree, like a literal decision tree. So we'll start, this is like the biggest decision that like moves me or nudges me in a certain direction or not. And uh, as you'll see, like, the, the, like for me, it's like really simple. I'm just gonna do decision tree equals tree um, I forgot the name of it, decision tree classifier. Decision tree classifier. And here you have to pass something which is called random state one, just because in this way you initialize the decision tree with some random values. And something which happens a lot in machine learning because if you start a decision tree with zero, these optimization algorithms are going to struggle a lot because they're doing, uh, well, derivatives, I didn't want to say that, but they're doing derivatives to try to improve the situation. So if you start with zero, they have like basically no direction where to go to. And instead if you start with random numbers, they'll like nudge a little bit like into the right direction instead. But for me as a user of the library, this like makes no difference whatsoever. So I'm just going to do decision tree uh, underscore equals decision tree dot fit. And we have the features and we have the names, right? And here I'm going to do print decision tree underscore score features names. Uh, no, names not defined. It's called target and the same here. And it's 97%. That's really good, right? Unfortunately not. 
Um, but I, I wish it would be like so good. But basically, the reason why this thing like thinks he almost got it right is because machines are quite ruthless, as we know. And if you just give machine free reign, he'll just like try to do like the dumbest thing possible, which means that it will try to fit a very basic like the the intuition of it. It will try to fit a very high order polynomial to it. So you will see something like this, and it'll try to fit a curve like this. And we are like, what? This makes no sense, right? But the thing is, since like most of these methods are numerical, they don't really, you know, like they don't have like our sense of judgment. So they're just trying to fit as much as they can. And then since we trained this like classifier on all the training data, it's always going to do, okay, I'm tr just trying to like, you know, do my best. And it's going to come up with like really weird results like this. So of course, uh, they tried to, came up with a, uh, to come up with a lot of techniques to try to uh, limit this, to try to fix this. And one of the ways is basically play, play hide and seek with the algorithm. So you're just gonna uh, intentionally withdraw some information. So I have these 10 points, but I'm, I'm only going to pass the algorithm six points because I know that the algorithm otherwise is going to get like overzealous and it's going to try to read too much into the data. But what I want the algorithm to do is to try to keep uh, like a sort of like generalization, right? And this would be like quite hard to do it yourself, but of course there is an amazing model, like a module in scikit-learn, which is called uh, model selection. And uh, I mean, I think it's like the general like, gist of the talk is just like learn scikit-learn because it's amazing and uh, yeah, but uh, if you, uh, you you take this thing and there's a function which is called uh, model selection dot cross val score, which is called a cross validation score. So as I said before, when you're withdrawing information from the algorithm, like in machine learning terms, the part of data that you're not using, well, it's not completely true, but whatever. Uh, just like, bear with me. The part of data you're hiding from the algorithm, like it's this general name is cross validation set. It's not always true, but uh, bear with me. Um, and so here you pass the decision tree, you pass the features, you pass the target. You have to decide uh, like a, a scoring like algorithm for the thing. In this case, we're going to use accuracy, and then you specify basically how many times he has to do this operation, right? And now we're going to print the scores, and we're going to print the average of the scores as well. And remember, this is something where we had 98% like accuracy before. But if we hide stuff from the algorithm, the algorithm actually reveals us as like, yeah, almost, right? You see like the average of like these 50 runs was like 0.78%, which is not super bad, but it's basically just as good as like the super simple approach that like my cat probably could like come up with. Um, I have a picture of my cat here. Oh. <laughs> I used this, like, no, it's not, like, yeah. Anyway, um, so, like, a good way to try to fix this is to try to create, to basically tell the algorithm, well, try not to read too much into the data. So here, there's, like, when you're creating this uh, classifier, you can specify um, some information, which is a max depth. So basically, you want to try to create a tree which is, uh, deeper than seven like levels, and then you can control also the sample split. So it's basically when he decides that he has to branch out. And in this case, I'm just gonna say two. And also in this case, I'm going to replace uh, decision underscore with genera. How do you spell generalized? Yeah. And it's one, two, three, four, five. This looks good. Um. So if I run this, you'll see that like our like generalized version of the tree uh, was like way less confident on the first run. It said like 88%, which was like still higher than the average when we tried to hide data from him. But like, in general, it was like gave like a much better performance than the like over optimistic one, right? And one of the huge problems in machine learning is that it's really hard to understand what the machine is thinking. And luckily, there's some really good tools, especially in uh, um, decision trees, which will allow to visualize this information. So I have to re uh, remember the correct API, but it's something like um, tree, export, graph, viz. And you pass uh, our generalized tree underscore. You pass these feature names, so that 
he can like associate with something, and we say out file equal uh, tree dot, and it's a dot file, right? So if I run this, it worked. Um, I'm gonna switch to, um, I'm gonna try to switch to another shell. Oh, I was in the shell. Okay, that's cool. And we see there's a tree dot. It's here. And if we take a look at this, is tree dot, whoa, is like not for humans still. Uh, but like since it's a dot file, there's this amazing tool just called dot. <laughs> and it can <laughs> transform a dot into something which we can process with our uh, brains, which is the PNG. And if I open that, you'll see this is what the algorithm sees. Uh, I'm going to zoom in uh, if I can. Cool. So um, do you remember like what was like our simple heuristic? It's the sex. And in, in the process of cleaning up the data, uh, we set sex to zero if you're uh, male or one if you're a female. And you see that the tree makes that like the top decision. So the decision tree understood that the sex is like something really, really important. And you see that it like splits off the, the sample. So like we have 891 here, but then if you're a man, we have 577 samples here, while on the other branch, we only have 340, uh, 314. And then the immediate decision after that is, what is your age? If you're a kid, you have to go on this side. And there's only 24 deceased people here. And instead here, there's like 500, well, it's not deceased, but there's like only a subset. So the maximum like deceased people in this set could be 24. And here in the other hand side, it would be 543. So in a sort of way, the algorithm understood like the human notion of uh, women and children first, right? And it's here, it's not like, a joke, right? It's like he actually built this, and it's an algorithm who did this, like just like by looking at the data. Um, cool. Uh, how much? I don't have much time. I think that would be it. Um, just a small thing. So I've put like most of this code on my GitHub. There's a repo which is called Jack Dice. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, there's also like all the instructions to set it up like on macOS, but I think like the same thing just works on Ubuntu or whatever you're using. I'm going to live tweet this technology. Um, so here is the repo of uh, no slides conf. Good, no slides. Cool, and that'll be it. <laughs> There's also more algorithms on the repo because I couldn't fit all, like, all the material in here. So for example, something which I think is super cool is that they have this thing which is called a grid search because like, uh, like most of these algorithms have a lot of parameters that you can fiddle with. And so they came up with this little thing which just like dumb, like in a really dumb way will just like try out all these different algorithms with like different parameters and just figure out which, which is uh, the value which works best. I think in this specific example, it doesn't really work that well because you only have, you know, like 900 rows. But like in a real case example, you'd have, you know, 20,000 rows or 40,000 rows. So if you're Google, you know, billions of billions of rows. And actually like these things like work much better. So I think like you don't, like even if you do that yourself, like don't get too, you know, stuck into, oh my God, this algorithm isn't working because machine learning, like I think a paper came out five years ago, which just said your, your algorithm doesn't really matter that much. Like who has, who has the most data wins. Um, so yeah, questions. Come on. I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I think someone said they're not, I'm not gonna leave, like, let, let you guys leave if you're not asking questions, so. <laughs> it's a standoff. Yeah, one there. That's how, like, you get to leave the room. Okay, uh, as a developer, I think uh, a lot of people is, uh, like me here, we don't know where to start uh, to do this stuff. Yeah. And uh, because I try with Coursera, other stuff like that, but they are too, uh, too theoretical. Yeah. That's uh, 
and we have another kind of approach that's it's fine but where, where we can start to to yeah. do this stuff so uh, I did the Coursera like the machine learning course on Coursera it has a little bit of math but I think that the teacher on that course is really good because uh, it says okay this is the math but it doesn't matter as long as you understand the intuition between like some of the machine learning concepts that's fine and uh, it's just like you just search for Coursera machine learning I really recommend this course and th this is the guy who actually created Coursera this guy he's like the uh, CTO of Coursera and this is really really good but something I have to admit is I stole a lot of stuff for this talk from this amazing website which is called Kaggle.com it's a data science competition website. So they do real stuff as well. So if you go on competitions, you'll see some of the top competitions have, you know, a hundred thousand, like a hundred fifty thousand dollars prize, right? It's called Kaggle.com. And some of the like this Titanic is one of the challenges. And for example, this is like where you get the data. They just like expose the CSVs. And there's also you can make a submission, so they also give you a test set where they don't give you the answer so you have to train your machine learning algorithm and fight against each other that would be the idea but then the internet came along and people you know like started to figure out the real historical data so that their algorithm would get 100% success rate so you, you see like the top uh, the top submitters are like cheating a lot and this is not actually what like data science is supposed to be but anyway uh, like that's the end of the rant um, but if you go here, there's like some really, really good Python notebooks. So if you take a look at, um, I think it's here. So it's using like, you can use Python, you can use R, and they have like really, really good explanations about everything. So what I did uh, at the time is just like go through, you know, like 10 of them, and just like take a look at what are the, like the best techniques and the things which I found more, uh, like more interesting. Like something I'm really, really interested in personally is neural networks. But I think like, for example, in, on this problem in specifically, it's not a good fit for a neural network. So like, I, you don't see like many people using it. And if they do, the performance is not great. If you want to play with neural networks, there's another really sort of like classic problem, which is uh, the um, uh, hand, handwritten recognition task. And that's really cool. Because like, you get to write a program which reads something like this and actually assigns it like the correct uh, class. And it's like such a, it's like sort of the hello world of data science. And they, it was only invented 15 years ago by uh, Jan LeCun, which, now, which is now head of the uh, Facebook AI group. But it's like a very, very classical task. It's just like so satisfying when you write the neural network and you see that it's actually recognizing handwritten digits, especially since you are a developer. So you know how you would solve it otherwise, right? You think about the digits, you think about the shapes they are, you try to run some stupid like image conversion algorithms or Im like some algorithm to try to rotate the, like the number in the right position. Like you, you have like this way of thinking. And instead the neural network just applies this sort of like brute force to it. And it's just like, there you go. This is like the result. And I think the, um, you know, like the industry standards for this problem, now they have 99.8% accuracy. And human beings have something like 98. So in some things, like these things are already unbeatable. And they have been unbeatable for the past 15 years. So. But it's really fun, so I really recommend it. They have a lot of like uh, examples in code there, so if you want to learn, it's really good. So how do you decide which algorithm to use? Do you just throw all the algorithms at the problem and look at the numbers, or are there any heuristics? Yeah, that's the hard question, because Basically, I, I mean, from what I've seen, I'm not an expert whatsoever, but from what I've seen, the people who are expert will just tell you, well, over time you'll learn which algorithm works best with what problem. So a lot of these competitions on Kaggle, for example, I haven't seen like good applications of um, neural networks, and I'm kind of pissed at that because I really want to see like how like one of these like real world problems can be solved using machine learning, but. Uh, like there are some really good papers about uh, you know like how like you use like neural networks in image recognition and stuff like that. So I think there's a sort of like general feeling in the community and you know, which are the best algorithms like which solve like some sort of problem. And every year they like publish like a, 
a crap load of papers like pr trying to prove that their algorithm works the best. But I think already like five years ago, they sort of came up with the idea that the best algorithm doesn't really matter that much. So they, they did like this really like serious experiment with just like ran, you know, like 10 different algorithms and they changed the, how much data they had. And they saw that when like they had a lot of data, like all the algorithms would pretty much like converge to the same point of performance. So it's mostly like how much you can afford, like what is like your, you know, like uh, machine learning architecture. But they seen like most people care just about like how much raw data you have. And I think like since I learned this, I'm much more you know, understanding of like why Facebook, why Google are so interested in your data because like, that's the real valuable stuff, right? Like a lot of like data set that we have just like to play around are like you know a thousand, two thousand, three thousand data sets like rows, and I'm sure that the internal uh, data set that Google engineers have to train their algorithms is just incredible, right? And that's like the real value of it, and that's why their machine learning algorithms work so much better than the rest. Well, they're really smart, but you know, they have also a lot of data. Um, okay. Is it good? No more questions? Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>